Uh, we do have folks joining us from Florida um, and all the way into Canada. And fortunately for you, Arnie has grown um, and started plants in Florida and up north. And so he's gonna have a little bit of advice that kind of covers the, all the bases. So Arnie, um, go ahead and take it away, please. So okay, we're talking about you. seed starting and growing transplants. Uh, thank you, Mindy. Um, good morning, everyone. I, mean, I guess maybe it's not morning for everybody or early morning. Um, the, actually, the impetus um, for this class is uh, a series that um, the Extension has been offering over the last um, three months or so on growing edibles. It's a, a short lunchtime half hour series, and there was a session on seed starting. So this is more like a deep dive. Um, if any of you have um, attended that, that class, um, a little bit of it uh, will be repeated. Um, if you didn't attend the class, uh, I'm gonna cover and everything anyway. I've been at this for about 50 years without revealing my age. Um, and uh, seed starting is a little like cooking. There's the, the, the recipe and the technique. Um, and I, I'll cover both in the presentation. The recipe is more of the things, the ingredients, things you need, um, the science behind it. Um, and the technique is, um, and a lot of things I've seen in seed starting don't really cover the technique. And that's the mechanics of it. So this is a brief outline of what, what I plan to cover today. First um, and, and most important is the advantages of growing transplants. Um, this may not be, be for everyone. Um, even after seeing this whole presentation, you may conclude if you've not started seeds that it's not for you, um, but there are some real advantages. Um, and the next brief, it'll just be a couple of charts um, on seed starting schedules. Um, if you've grown anything, vegetables, especially vegetables and flowers, which are annuals, you know that timing is very important. And the seed starting is the beginning of that, of, of that timing schedule. Um, then we'll go into the equipment, the materials, the supplies that you'll need, um, light fixtures, seed starting containers, just some useful planting and transplanting tools um, that I've accumulated over the years. Many of them you have just in your house now. Um, we'll talk about uh, soil mixes and fertilization, um, uh, very different than what you would use um, when you put the transplant in the ground. And then I'll take you through the, the whole process of seed starting, starting with germination, transplanting, moving the transplants outdoors, what weather protection you need, and that's gonna be very dependent on what part of the country you're growing in. And the last part of the presentation, which will be mostly um, slides, is since I do this every year, I will take you through the last seed starting, full seed starting cycle um, that I went through for the fall 2020 planting um, here in Florida. Okay. Um, the biggest pro of uh, starting uh, your own seeds your own transplants from seeds is just, this is vegetables, but just this is an unlimited choice. If you've ever gone into a, a, a nursery or a big box store, uh, and if you were buying vegetable transplants, you may find two or three aisles worth, a lot more flowers. So you, if you're starting your own, if you've ever gotten a seed catalog or looked online, there's just thousands and thousands of varieties to choose from. It can be mind boggling and you'll have to spend some time um, deciding what you want to grow and why uh, that, that would be a subject for a, a course in itself. Um, the other advantage you have is you can you can stagger your seed starting times for multiple varieties. In other words, you decide when you want to plant to put in the ground and you decide when you're going to start the seed. Um, and many times in the stores, you don't find what you want and when you want it. So I, I summarize this as customized timing. Um, and at the extension, um, one of the, the big principles of landscaping is right plant, right place. I think for seed starting, it's right plant at the right time. Um, another advantage, for me, this is a very big advantage since 
all my all my planting now is in community gardens. You can take advantage of the latest varieties. It could be the size of the plant, the size of the fruit, heirlooms, if you're into heirlooms, disease resistance, um, if you're growing vegetables, the shape of the fruit, the size of the fruit, taste, the yield, and new releases come out every year. There's a tremendous amount of research going on in, um, in hybridization. That's a, an old technique, not to be confused with um, genetic messing around, not, not GMO. This is just traditional taking the pollen from, from one plant and you know, depositing it in, in a different variety. And probably really the biggest advantage, and I, I don't take advantage of this much in Florida, but I did in New York is you can grow all your own annual flowers. And, and for here in Florida, things like geranium, geraniums, pentas, marigolds, petunias, galadalia, celosia, and just on and on. If you just go up the aisles, as I said, in any of the, any of the stores that sell transplants, you'll see the flowers. And here you can actually, this can actually be money saving because buying tr flower transplants does get expensive. And the last pro is you're pretty much doing this in a sterile environment. So you're getting plants that are pretty much free of disease. Um, there are some cons. Um, there's an initial investment. You have to equipment and material costs. It does take um, an average of six to eight weeks um, to go from a seed to about a 10 to 12 inch transplant. That would be for a vegetable. Uh, depending on the flower, it could be that big. If it's got a stem, it's a short stocky plant, it would be much smaller. They do require daily, daily care. You need to water them um, usually every day, sometimes every other day. And it does require transplanting um, to produce good stocky plants. The professional growers pretty much, you buy the, the container that the seed has been grown in um, and they try to, you know, get that as stocky as they can without transplant. Okay, so this picture is, that's actually one of, one of, one of my, one of my uh, set of plants and there's some, these are vegetables, there's some peppers and tomatoes and eggplants in there. So that, that's what you want. You want your transplants to look like that. You want them to be stocky, uh, good, good green leaves. Um, so where do you start? Okay, so before you even go out and buy anything, um, there's some questions that you really need to answer. The first is how many plants do you want to grow? Do you want to just grow a few plants, 10 plants, 50 plants, 100 plants, 200 plants, 500 plants? Um, when I was doing this at my home in New York, I just really enjoyed doing this. I was growing a couple of thousand transplants. So I kind of crossed the line from, you know, home grower almost into professional grower. And the techniques change depending on um, how, many, how many transplants you want to grow. Um, and then where do you want to start the seeds? Um, and in later charts, you'll see really the best place to start seeds um, pretty much in most parts of the country, even here in Florida, is indoors. So where are you going to do this? Um, I start mine in a spare room here in Florida. It's actually the room I'm doing the presentation in. Um, you can start them in a garage, not 12 months a year in Florida, um, in a closet, in a shed, in a corner of a room, on top of a, a, a desk you have. So there's lots of places to start to start your, your seedlings. Um, a bigger question is, this is going to expand. Um, the seeds, the seedlings are very small. They don't take up a lot of space, but they grow rapidly. And after you transplant them, they're gonna grow even more rapidly. So you need to decide, do you have the space to put all these transplant trays outside? Um, just like any other, anything you would put in your, in your garden. Um, they need at least six hours or more sunlight. And then how much money do you want to spend? Um, do you want to plan for expansion when you get started? It's, it's not too hard. I'll be showing you lots of examples of seed starting um, setups um, that 
either have been built to be expandable or can be expanded. And then once you've answered all these questions, then what do you need to get started? Well, they need light, so you need a light fixture indoors. And it'll be artificial light, um, usually fl fluorescent bulbs of one sort or another. And these could be anywhere from zero to $200. The reason um, the zero is in there is because um, if you have an under, under cabinet fluorescent light, you could use that to start your seeds. So you may have you may have the light source if you have the space there right in your house. Starting trays, again, um, you may have plastic trays from gardening. You may have the start, starting trays you need um, in your house already. Um, you could spend up to about $50 on starting trays. Um, when you get into transplanting, either transplant them into pots or transplant trays. And again, um, over the years, I've accumulated all kinds of pots and trays. So at some point, you, you have everything you need. You may have it already. Um, could spend anywhere up to about $25. Accessories, um, these, when I show you these, you'll, you'll, they'll be a little unusual, but they aid in seed starting anywhere from 5 to $10. And the stars on the first four items um, really say, once you invest in these forever, for as long as you want to in, uh, get involved in seed starting, they don't really wear out. There are some um, pots, peat pots, and we'll talk about them. We plant the, the pot um, in the ground and, and they're not reusable, but just about everything in, a, in the equipment you'll have is reusable. Um, only two things you really need to replace every, every time you start seeds. And the first is a seed starting mix. It can be anywhere from 15 to $30. And you'll be using some form of liquid fertilizer um, to fertilize the, 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 the seedlings and the transplants. Okay. So next couple of charts um, is when to start your transplants. And the best way to uh, look at this is to find out what zone you're in. Where I am in Southwest Florida, we're in um, zone 10A and B. And you can find all this information on the internet. You just put in your zip code and Google your zip code and, 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 and the planting zone. Here, our, our frost danger runs from about the middle of December to about the middle of February. So we're just about out of um, frost danger here in Southwest Florida. And I'm in Venice. Um, and we had, we had a light frost about a week ago, very light frost. Um, so when to sow the seeds, and really, this is going to line up with when you would normally plant, be it vegetables or flowers, um, in your garden. And here in Southwest Florida, we really have four growing seasons. So we have four seed starting cycles. And I'll start with um, probably for, for vegetable gardeners, certainly uh, the most, most productive one starts um, toward the end of the summer. And if you're growing warm weather crops and vegetables, or even flowers that, that, that don't like hot, but do well, in moderate heat, um, and you'll be planting these things in the month of September. Um, you have to back that up about eight weeks for when you would start the seeds. And then, and that's, um, you look at the July for starting seeds um, in Florida, when the temperature is 95 degrees every day outside, you don't want to be doing the seed starting outside. The seedlings don't like it. I'm sure you, you don't like it either. So indoors and air conditioning in Florida is a, in the summers is really a, a good place to start the seeds. As we start to approach the, the cooler weather, which for here in Florida, you know, between the middle of October and the middle of November, our temperatures start to get, you know, nice days in the mid 80s and nights you start to get into the into the 60s. Um, you, again, you back that up for when you would start the seedlings by a couple of months and you're, so you're starting your cool weather crops if they're vegetables, some of your um, flowers like impatience, 
um, and begonias that really like the cooler temperatures would be starting them here in Florida in the month of in the month of September. Um, and again, now we have a, a relatively long, mild winter in Florida, um, and you could be continuing starting um, all during. Um, from the beginning of September up until about December and still be putting out cool weather vegetables and flowers that would that would do well in the cooler temperatures. But starting in December, um, you would be you would be you would be starting again your warm weather vegetable crops like tomatoes and peppers and eggplants, um, some of your warmer flowers um to be planted when the real danger of frost is gone which is sometime um, in the month of february and then the last um season for people that either want to grow summer vegetables or want flowers during the summer uh, march to april in, in here in southwest florida is when you would again start start your seeds and you would be planting um probably mid-april to mid-may um, and I threw this chart in um, when I realized that we have a lot of people that are signed in from other parts of the country. And actually, I spent about 35 years in the Hudson Valley, which is a zone 5B, 6A um, in New York State. And here the frost danger, um, first frost for, again, my area was around the middle of October and didn't end till about the middle of May. And of course, there was a three or four or five months where the ground froze and with ice and snow on it, so you obviously weren't planting anything. But in terms of seed starting, um, the, 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 the spring seed starting for New York would be the beginning of March um, and everything's compressed because it's cooler. Um, we may have a few people really from even more north than I am, even from Canada, it's compressed even more. So everything gets squeezed tighter together. And you would, you need to work out these dates based on, on, your, um, on your zone and your local extension can certainly help you. But you can see 3-1 for the cool weather crops, start 3-15 for the summer crops, and then pretty much done until about the beginning of July for fall weather crops. Again, very short seasons on the cool weather crops um, in New York State. Okay, and this, um, I think it's the last chart in this section. I just wanted to put down some um, typical times from when you would put the seed in the ground to when you would get um, a good size transplant um, to put in your garden. Um, Starting on the left with vegetables, um, with celery, and again, this is a, actually the first year I grew celery. It does very well here in Southwest Florida. Um, it's got a very long time. It's a very small seed, and that asterisk means, and we'll talk about this in a lot more detail um, later on, um, it, needs light, it need, needs light to germinate. So these seeds need to sit on the surface to get good germination. Um, eggplants and peppers next longest, eight to nine weeks, tomatoes, seven to eight weeks, basil and dill, six to seven weeks, broccoli and cauliflower, about the same, lettuce and spinach, less, five to six weeks, um, cucumbers, four to five weeks. Um, you don't have to start cucumbers. They can be started direct sowed. I start my own cucumbers um, because of the diseases that cucumbers get. I want to give them a head start in the garden to try to get ahead of the diseases. On the right hand side, I've listed some of the common flowers. Um, you see a lot more asterisks, a lot more flowers do require light. And what you'll find is the seeds that require light are very small. And we'll talk about how to handle these seeds, how to, how to get them onto the surface. Um, and that gets some more into technique. So marigolds, five to six weeks, and patients, seven to eight weeks. Gera geraniums are about the longest um, at 10 to 11 weeks, a very small seed. You have to be very patient with it. Pentas, eight to nine weeks. Gallardia, six to seven weeks. Gallardia is a great Florida summer uh, flower. It really likes hot weather. 
um, Celosia six to seven weeks, Petunias eight to nine weeks. And, and again, there's just literally hundreds, if not thousands of varieties in both of those columns. Um, they fall into categories. So I've, I've just tried to list um, a few of them. Um, okay, before we get into equipment, um, Mindy, do we have any, any, any questions that um, we should address um, in the, in Yes. So we do have some questions and um, some of them relate to temperature uh, for germination, um, starting seeds outside, starting seeds, seeds inside, greenhouse yeah. versus garage, that type of thing. And yeah. I think we have quite a bit coming up on those. Yeah. So, yeah. If, yeah. Yeah, so if folks can hang tight about the temperature, your, your more recent slides were kind of more about the timing because like you mentioned, for seeds and starter plants, the, the right time is important. Um, and people are asking about plant charts for our zones and I can follow up with those. So I think one of the questions would be based on like the last slides you were showing, if somebody was near our area um, and they wanted to go ahead and get started with starting their seeds, um, What's the methodology for them? Do they fast forward and say, if this takes eight weeks to grow, um, I would be putting it out at what month? And then they determine what they should sow based on that. Like, how do they decide what they should be planting? Exactly, exactly right. You would start with, if you were gonna buy the transplant, whether it's a flower or a vegetable, um, when would you put it in the ground? If, you're, if now is the right time to put it in the ground, it's, it's really too late to start the seeds. If you're gonna plant something, say in April, um, let's say you, you, know, you, you, you like summer flowers. Um, there's a whole bunch of flowers that really do well in Florida, even in the heat. Um, you're starting to come into the time that you would start a whole bunch of flowers that you would plant, say in April, um, all around your house, or even in, you know, even if in, in a community garden, if you were growing summer vegetables and you wanted to have flowers. So you really work backwards. You start with when you would want to plant in, in the open ground or in a pot, um, and then work backwards from that. Thank you. And so some of the folks are asking for the charts and the lists, and I can put some links in the chat, and then they'd be included in a follow-up email that you'd receive usually within a few days of today's webinar. Um, but most of what I'll um, copy over is going to be for our zone. Um, yeah. The, the other thing I could do, Mindy, if you want, I could, I could just pull out the few charts on timing and send them to you and that would be maybe that would be easier yeah I, if you can and we'll include that in the resource list that that um that we email out yeah um, right. if someone's just interested in that you just get that yeah uh, and then to answer a quick question somebody was asking about greenhouse and if you're in florida greenhouses are great but depending on how you're zoned and, and price wise um and airflow because they can get quite hot um you know, you might want to try seed starting and see how you like it before investing in a greenhouse would be my thought, but. Yeah, and, and I, my, uh, you can actually buy small greenhouses. They're very expensive. You really don't need them. As I go through these next set of charts, I think people will see that you pretty much have what you need around your house. You may have to, to buy um, some equipment, but you definitely, unless you're going commercial, you don't need a greenhouse. You, you really can do this really just with around your house um, type of um, locations, both out. Okay, so, um, so along those lines, because I know some folks will be asking about temperature and everything like that, but if you can, um, like you said, some of the materials we may have. So if you want to go ahead and, and start talking about equipment, that's great. Okay. So I'm going to start first with the light fixtures. Um, and light intensity is very important. Um, to grow good, healthy transplants, the minute that seed pops out of the ground, it needs the strongest light you can provide it. Um, 
A good fluorescent light usually is enough, but only for a certain amount of time. The longer the plant stays under the lights, um, the stronger the light intensity needs to be. Um, you solve most of that problem, we'll get into that, um, by just making sure that the seedlings are close to the lights. And you'll see in the, it'll be six to eight inches. You'll see it on a later chart. Um, but basically, um, the simplest, if you're gonna, if you're gonna buy and you don't wanna assemble anything yourself, the simplest thing you can buy, um, uh, prefabricated, every seed catalog will sell them. Um, they're only too glad to sell them. Um, it, it's basically an under the cabinet light that they've modified so that it can be raised and lowered. And I'll show you pictures of these easily. Um, some of them, the, the cheapest ones don't even come with a bulb. Um, some of them will come with one bulb. Um, some of them will have two bulbs. Uh, anywhere from fifty to one hundred and fifty dollars. Um, they're about twenty-four inches long. They have basically about a, it's an eighteen-inch bulb, and again, that height's adjustable because you always want to keep the lights six to eight inches above the top of the plant. Remember that plant is growing pretty fast, even even indoors. So you're you're constantly adjusting the height, and then when you have multiple plants, they grow at different rates. So that's something you want to think about also. <clears throat> and these basic ones are capable of starting 50 to 100 seedlings. Um, and then there's the advanced prefabricate, prefabricated um, systems. They have two to four bulbs and you're starting to get over $200. It's really the same, <clears throat> the same structure as the basic one, except it's basically double decker. So you now have two levels, one on top of the others, still 24 inches long, uh, just two sets of lights, and you, you double or triple the amount of seedlings you can start. <clears throat> and now you can get into build your own, which really is what I would recommend because uh, all you need is a, a hammer, a saw, some nails, um, maybe a drill. I actually don't need the drill. <clears throat> um, and these, these you, can, you can build them with a fixed height, and I'll show you some of my own. And instead of adjusting the lights, you adjust the tray up and down. And you can put you know, books under them. So this, you can adjust the height by lowering and raising the light or lowering or raising the tray. Also capable of starting 50 to 100 seedlings. And you can build one of these for about $60. And you can also build your own using a four foot shop light. And I think this is the best alternative. I'll show you an example of one that I use here in Florida. Um, anywhere from two to eight bulbs, depending on whether you want to make it expandable, um, 40 to $100. Um, and a 48 inch um, bulb, normal shop light bulb, has a much higher light intensity than the under the cabinet light. So. You, you're, you're solving that light intensity problem as well. And these things are capable of starting a lot of seedlings. Um, you just need a little space, not much, and capable of starting three to 600 seedlings. And the last, the last fixture is, and again, I'll show you an example of that. It's right where I'm sitting. You can't see it now, but I will show you pictures of it. Um, if you have an under the counter fluorescent light, and most people do, especially in the kitchen, and you can get away with putting a tray. And my kitchen would be next to the stove, would be convincing my wife that I'm not gonna make a mess. Um, you have it. Um, you have a fixed height again, so you just raise the tray. And again, just like the ones you buy, capable of starting 15 to 30 seedlings. And if you're just starting out, this would be a good first experiment for you. Okay, so I'm taking through some pictures um, the picture on the left is that basic fixture. Um, um, it's a, it, the bulb isn't included. It, it's a very narrow strip. Um, and you can see that they have a little bar. You see it on the left where it, it raises and lowers, adjusting to the height. Uh, one thing it doesn't have um, is reflectors. A lot of that light is going to escape. What you really like to do 
is have some kind of white reflector, which shop lights do have, that reflects some of that light down onto the plant and you don't lose it. And we're going to talk about starting trays. And in this particular picture, they're not seed starting. They just have some plants and pots there. But that little tray that they're in, which is a very common tray, that's an excellent tray to start seeds in. So if you happen to have one of those around, if you bought plants and they gave it to you to take the plants home with, you've got your seed starting tray. Uh, the one on the right is really for, and the, and the picture is taken in a kitchen, so it's really to, to show you that you can do this in your kitchen. It's much more attractive and it's much more expensive. All right, it's, you know, over, over $150. Um, and you see the tray on the bottom. Um, the light on the top, you've got two bulbs in there and you get the reflector in there. Okay, now we're going to um, even more expensive fixtures. Um, and basically all they've done here, the fixture on the left, that's just a shop light. All right, and it's hanging from chains. Um, all they've provided is, is basically that um, uh, metal structure to hold everything. Um, and you can build that out of wood and buy the shop light yourself and save yourself a lot of money. And the one on the right, which is again to be over, over almost over $250, um, is basically the one on the left double decker. Two shop lights. Um, okay, and now we now we get into mine. The one on the left, um, just for informational purposes. I actually start my Florida transplants in New York because I'm a seasonal gardener now. I spent five months in New York and I just got to the point where I just totally unsatisfied um, with what I could buy um, anywhere, whether it's a nursery and a big box store. So I, I basically start my plants in New York, get them to fit in the car and drive them down to Florida. So that's the fixture I constructed. It's basically got um, two under the counter fluorescent lights. I actually added a third one that you can see a little later than this picture was taken, um, an LED one to get a little more intensity. And it, it was under $60. The, the most of the cost is going to be the under cabinet lights. And I'm in a very limited, I'm in a small um, condo. Um, the picture was taken out of my little deck, which is about um, eight feet long by four feet wide. Um, behind that deck, you see a door, um, a very small shed with a water heater, and that little fixture just sits in there in the corner there. So I was very space constrained, um, and I needed something that was very compact. Um, and it does the job. The fixture on the right, that's actually something I built for my daughter. Um, that would more mimic what you saw in the, in the last, um, in fact, I'll just go back to it for a second. Now, one on the right for $250, that mimics that, home, home built, just built out of basic lumber. Um, and my, in, in this picture, my daughter has a small condo upstairs, and it's tucked into a little, little um, vestibule in the corner there. And at this point in her seat starting, um, she only had one light, and she's since expanded that, and the lower one has lights and she's expanded it to put two fluorescent fixtures on each one. Um, and you can build that um, anywhere from 40 to $100. Again, so that would be um, the most cost efficient way. Um, you do need, if you look at it, it's about 12 inches wide. It's four, in, four feet long. You need to be able to have a place um, to put that. Um, this was built with bolts, so the sides will, will, will the top comes off, um, and the whole thing can be stored in a closet when it's not in use. So that's probably what I would recommend um, if you're thinking of building one of these. Ernie, I uh, have a question. So if sure. somebody's um, like me, who I'm not particularly handy, um, but if I had like a bookshelf at home that I could spare a shelf or two, um, could I try and, and make a go of it with a bookshelf? Absolutely. If you can mount, if you can mount or at least some way hold the light, hold the, the fixture under there, get the fixture under the, the light fixture. 
under there. So let me let me show you this next picture. This might be what you have, but you don't have the light. Um, this is actually it's it's not the desk I'm presenting on. It's the one next to it. This is in the room I'm I'm talking now. Um, you see the fluorescent fixture. I have you know under counter fluorescent fixtures in my study. Um, and you can see the you can see everything here. You can see the seed starting tray on the bottom. Uh, the seeds have already germinated. Um, what you see on the left top, let me use, let me use my, um, hopefully I don't see my pointer. That's a shop light. Uh, most people have a shop light somewhere in their house, or if they don't, they're pretty cheap to buy. That's a compact fluorescent in there, um, very bright light. Um, and it's supplementing the, the fluorescent. Um, actually, what I'm growing here, Really, we'll, we're going to come and hit a lot of these in detail, but I'll just mention it now. On the left here, just germinating, those are cucumbers. You can see they're very big, big with respect to what's on the right. What's on the right, those are lettuce seedlings. And so these, these are, this was done around Christmas time. This is very recent. Um, they have very different temperature requirements. So that shop light, that you see there actually was underneath the tray. The tray was hanging off a little platform that I have there. And that was underneath because the cucumbers were like about 15 degrees warmer um, soil temperature than the cucumbers. So we heated up the left-hand side. We'll, we'll talk about that funny thing in there. That's a temperature monitor. Those trays are just in there to hold the dirt because I didn't need the whole tray. So to answer your question, Mindy, this is all you need to start seeds, really anywhere. It was too cold to do this on a lanai or in a garage um, in December. So temperature was pretty good in the house, in my house anyway, it's temperatures are in the seventies and lettuce is okay with that. It doesn't need any heating. Um, and I'll show you the temperature charts um, a little later in the presentation. Cucumbers need it much warmer, mid to upper 80s for soil temperature. Um, if we switch to the picture on the right, here's my shop light, same room. In fact, it's right next to, here's the edge of the, edge of the desk there. It's just in a corner of the room. That's the room and the area it takes, takes about a foot. I think I found this little metal contraption in a seed catalog, really convenient. Go chains to hold it open on the bottom. Um, you can buy the, I don't know if it came with the chains for the, for the love for the shop light. Um, and, and this picture was taken, oh, about two weeks later. Um, and you can see how quickly things grow. These little cucumbers are already this big. The lettuce is about that big. That was a late blooming cucumber that I just, wanted to hang in there and it really had some problems. We just grew it to see how it would do. Um, but again, this, this is really all you need. Uh, a setup like this, you can start two or 300 seedlings under something like this. And you, you, you can, again, you can build it, or assemble it with, in this case, almost no tools if you can find this contraption. I don't even know where I got it. It was a while ago. So that's all you really need. Like I said, I said this is about thirty dollars to do that. Arnie, while well, we're still on the topic of lights, um, one or two questions came in. Do is there a difference between fluorescent and LED as far as preference, pros, cons, and if um, and is there any issue with using like a, a metal shelf, um, you know that type of thing? And we do have quite a few slides uh, to come up, so. Um, the fast version, if you can. Okay, uh, it lights the brighter the better. So LEDs are obviously more expensive, um, but they're going to give you more light. Um, they're going to give you um, better a better place. It really depends on how long you're going to keep the plants under the lights. You really don't want to keep them there any longer than they have to. You do want to get them outside, and that's going to depend on where you're growing. Um, in cold climates, you have to keep them under longer. Um, 
but I found in all the years, and I've used shop lights for 30, 35 years, they provide enough light. Okay. Okay, you don't have to go anything stronger than a shop light. A, a four foot um, fluorescent, regular, you only grow lux, regular fluorescent bulb um, will provide enough light. LEDs, more if you're space limited, and you really, I would say, if you have to use an under counter light, um, an LED is gonna provide you with a brighter light. And even for the case on the left, um, if you've got a shop light, anything, any light source, the, the stronger, the better. But the, but the fluorescent um, will provide enough up to a point in time. The plant gets- <laughs> Yeah, and I would add a, ca a caveat for, um, I, I was looking at some of the lights online and some of them report like mimicking sunlight. And so they do um, give off some UV uh, type of light. And for some of those, you'd wanna be selective as to where you position it. So it's not an area that you're staring at, um, you know, as far as uh, protecting your eyesight type of thing. Um, so, you know, and there's a lot of information online if you're looking at the lights, but like Arnie said, you don't have to go super complicated and, and throw a lot of money at it. Um, you may have something at home that's uh, very functional for what you're looking for. All right. Yes, and I think you'll find that um, traditional lights, whether it's an under cabinet light or a shop light, will provide enough light. Uh, it really depends whether you want to grow the plants um, their entire life, you can grow plants under artificial lights for their entire life. But if, if your goal is to move them to a location, put them in your garden, then you're going to be moving them outdoors and as soon as as soon as you can. And we'll cover a little bit of that. Thank you, Arnie. Okay, one last picture. Um, here are the plants from the previous picture. Um, this was right before they went in the ground. And you can see the, the difference in size. The lettuce is obviously quite a bit bigger. Cucumbers are more than ready to go in the ground. Actually, I would have grown the lettuce even bigger than this. Uh, I just had to plant them because I was gonna be away for three or four days. Um, and you can see the difference in the dates. Um, that was on 1.8, you can see the size. 1.23, you know, a little more than two weeks later. Um, and again, in Florida, the advantage um, I have is even, even in January, we've had some very cold nights um, and some not, not nice days where it was very, very windy and cold. So they didn't protect the plants. They're just uh, on the south side of my lanai. If it was too nasty a day, I'd move them back under the lights for the day. At night, it doesn't matter. Just move them indoors. Okay. So now what type of container do you use um, to start the seeds? And the answer is pretty much anything. Just shallow container, two to four inches deep. Um, none, of my, none of my seed starting containers uh, have drainage holes. And this is, we're back into technique, um, how you water them. If you're, if you're too generous with the water, you can, you can rot the roots um, and drainage will help prevent that. But you really don't need the drainage when you're, when you're, when you're starting the seeds. And they come in, containers come in different varieties. I've shown you some plastic trays. Um, and actually, I actually bought uh, a seed starting uh, setup with a tray and a plastic cover. And I'll show you that in a, a slide or two with um, styrofoam cutouts for what's called plugs. It's a very small um, peat starter. And I, I just said, no way, it's too small. So I use the trays though, and I use the cover. So the plastic trays, I'll give you flexibility for seedling size. Um, that means you can space the bigger the bigger seeds like, like I was starting cucumbers and lettuce um, at, for, at different spacings. It gives you more uniform moisture control because it's a bigger soil area and allows the plants to develop larger, stronger root systems. Um, more, and really the most common thing you'll see when you buy these trays is the plastic trays with about two, two inch dividers. 
And the and even when you if you go and buy transplants in the store, um, you'll buy a four pack or a six pack. They're basically in two inch or one and three quarter inch square plastic containers. Uh, a seedling outgrows that in two or three weeks. So anything you buy in a container like that, it's probably pot bound. And they come in 24, 48, 96, 96 sections. They look great in the seed catalogs. Um, moisture control is difficult, um, especially when you put these things outside on a hot day. Um, and then there's the peat. The peat is um, actually material that you, you're going to find in, in seed starting mixes, but they compress it and they can make um, actually a, a, a pot out of it. Um, they can make a pellet out of it when they compress it. Um, and it, it allows you to transplant without taking um, the seedling out of the pot. Um, just like in a two inch standard pot, the seedling is going to outgrow that pot quickly. And the big disadvantage of peat pots is they, 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 they act like a wick. If you allow the pot itself to dry out, it will actually suck the water out of the soil. So if you're going to use peat pots, you really want to keep the pot itself damp at all times. And then the last one, which again is this is really my preference when I'm starting a large quantity, uh, is use a shallow wooden tray. Um, you build it, you put a plywood bottom on it, and here I would drill the holes. Um, only because it's going to be outside and I'll be watering, um, maybe with a watering can at some point. Um, it has all the advantage of the plastic trays, um, and you can customize the length and the width and the depth. Um, I had special, um, I built special trays for my tomatoes, for example, because they're, uh, they produce a very vigorous deep root system. Uh, a plant like lettuce, which is a very shallow gap. Yeah. So here's some examples. Uh, on the left here, this is what, what you might find to be 2448. This happens to be a 72 pack. They're very inexpensive. And here in the bottom, um, almost looks like they doctored the picture. Here you have a bunch of seedlings. Um, they've got their first true leaves on them. But actually, every one of these seedlings is probably ready to be transplanted. If you pop one of these out of the plastic pot, you probably see the roots have completely filled it. So they're good for starting, but um, you'll find if you keep the seedlings in this, in this too long, they're really going to get pot bound. Um, they're going to get stressed. Their growth is going to get inhibited. The one on the right, um, this is actually what I bought. Um, and then you can see the tray I, I'm using now. I actually use this cover to hold in the moisture when I start to seize. And it's got little adjustable things to let a little air out. Those are the plugs it came with. And they're quite small. They're about three quarters of an inch square. And, you know, they, they'll expand into about a, a, an inch diameter. All right. So I threw away the styrofoam tray and I just used the tray and the cover. Okay, here's some more. Again, the one on the left, um, they sell pea pots in, in um, this is in 12, in, in um, 12 foot section, 12, I'm sorry, 12 um, piece sections. All right, this is a 10 pack. It's very inexpensive, about $5. Um, the one on the right, this is um, my own personal um, transplant, I use it, I, sometimes I use it to start, but mostly to transplant into. It's about four inches deep. You can see the holes drilled in the bottom, piece of plywood. This travels from New York to Florida to New York, because um, it's what I use to, to transplant and to transport my seedlings, my transplants. And there's a, a individual peat pot by itself. That's a, a two inch peat pot. Okay, uh, when you first look at this picture, it looks like um, we switched subjects into cooking. Um, these are um, 
tools that I find very useful um, in starting seeds. Knife and a fork, and I use these even in the garden. Um, and I'll, and I'll, I'll go through what you, what you use these for. The knife, it's just a regular serrated steak knife. Steak knife. Um, they're very useful for making a clean cut. If you have these seeds in a tray, um, the roots will start to grow into one another. And if you make a clean cut just on the edges of the roots, you'll get little or no transplant shock. Um, the thing on the lower right, that's um, a glass aquarium fish thermometer. Um, you don't have to buy an expensive soil thermometer. That really does a good job. They're a couple of bucks. You just go into a pet store, buy two or three of them, and I stick them um, all around my starting tray. You saw it in the previous chart. And even if you're using you know, the trays with dividers, take a couple of of the dividers, don't put a don't put a seedling a seed in them. Put the the, the the soil mix in them. Keep it moist. Put the thermometer in there to monitor the soil temperature. And spread several of them around the planting tray. For small seeds, a seal seed dispensers. Um, I've not used them. I've seen them. Um, I don't know how well they work on really really small seeds, seeds that almost hard to see individually because they look like dust. So this metal strainer um, is my seed, a part of my seed dispensing scheme. So let me show you on the next chart. This is what I use to start my celery. On the right here, um, uh, in, the, in the plastic bowl on top, that's a, the seed starting mix that you'll, you'll You'll, when you buy it, this is what it's going to look like. Um, and on the left, that's the, the sea starting mix after I've just strained it through the metal strain and just shaking it into, into this. And you can see it's very fine peat moss. All right. And so what you're going to do is, this is these are celery seeds. There's about 25 or 30 of them. And I got my phone as close to them as I could without... I'm losing focus, but they're very small, too small to even pick up. So you sprinkle, and you don't want to sprinkle too many because, as I said, this if you start looking and try to count them, there's a good 20 or 30 seeds in there. So you take the seeds here after you get rid of this, put this back in your mix, okay, and you just pour them on the top here and then just go back and forth and just mix them, like you're mixing up a cake mix or anything else. Just mix the seeds into the mix so they're, th they're thoroughly dispersed in there. And that's probably too much. You wouldn't use that much. And here's where your technique is going to be important. And you will probably want to practice this without the seeds. What you're basically going to do is once the seeds are mixed, whatever area that you've allocated for whatever seeds are growing, in this case, for me, with celery, you're going to basically try to sprinkle this seed peat mix, fine mix, finely sifted mix, onto the surface of a, an already damp, and we'll, we'll get to that in a second, um, seed starting mix. Once it's on the surface, you're done. You're not going to cover it. The seeds need light. Um, I found that to be really the most efficient way to disperse small seeds um, onto a surface. The other thing you'll need is a, a, a quart spray bottle. You don't have to buy it. You can take a Windex bottle, just rinse it out real good. All right. And you're really going to use this to keep your so soil surface damp until germination. You really probably don't want, you don't want, ever want to use a watering can for before the seeds have germinated and you probably don't want to use it after. So at most you want to get a small two ounce plastic bathroom cup because you really have to water very gently. Um, in the case of the celery seed here, you don't even want to use the cup. What you would do is you would hold your, your hand out. You can't see my hand, but you hold your hand out flat over the, over the seeds um, and you would spray the water 
onto your hand and just let it drop at a time. A little patience might take 15 or 20 seconds and just move your hand over the entire surface. You don't need much. Uh, just really a few drops here and there will keep it damp. And the last thing is a cuticle scissor. scissor. Um, especially with smaller seeds, uh, uh, celery included, um, and even my lettuce, I had way too many seeds. Um, you want to thin out your seeds as, as soon as possible. You want to identify which plants seem to be the strongest. Um, and you really, even for small plants, and lettuce would be a small plant, you really want to thin them out to about an inch separation before you transplant them. And that's where the knife and the fork are going to come in very handy. You're literally going to cut out a little cube. Um, you want to be able to lift that up. It should be uh, damp enough. So it really should lift up. The root should have fully filled it. So it'll hold, hold its shape. And you, you're putting it into the, the final, whether it's a box or a pot. So that's, that's the equipment. Okay. I Mindy, any questions on uh, before we get to the mixes, which will really be the, the last? Um, I, I think folks are going to be eager to, to learn about the temperature germination and things like that in the soil. And for timing, um, okay. I ask that they can keep putting questions in the chat. But we'll hold the questions until until the end because we're okay. we run okay. over. Sorry, Arnie. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. We'll we'll uh, we'll try to go a little fast. I don't want to go too fast, but we'll, um, what soil to use? That's an easy question to answer. Potting soil is too heavy. You want a very very light mix. Um, regular soil may contain disease, and it's also too heavy. You really want to use a soilless mix. Um, all, all the nurseries and big box stores sell it. Um, it's typically made up of two thirds Peter sphagnum moss and about one third vermiculite or perlite. It's what the professionals use. If you've ever bought, and I'm sure most of you have, um, any transplant in a store, it's what, what, what it's grown in. It has very high porosity. It's like a sponge to water. It's disease free. Uh, usually it has no nutrients though. Pete is starting to become um, ecological question mark. Um, and I've even seen some of the stores, um, they have plants that are now growing in something called coconut core. Um, it may be hard to find. Pretty much everything that you'll find will contain peat. Um, it's typically cold, sold in 10 to 20 quart packages. And again, this has to do with how many seeds you're going to start. Um, the size of your transplant trays. This is all a question of how many transplants you really want to grow. Um, for me, and I use, I do use grow boxes. Um, you can buy them in two cubic feet sizes, which is about 60 quarts. It's more economical. And you never want to reuse the starting mix um, because along the way, um, the seeds, the seedlings, there may be disease around where you're growing them, especially when you move them outside. So it's good to start fresh. Fertilizer. Um, you really, and there are, there are seed starting mixes that have fertilizer included in them. You can buy them, they're more expensive. Um, I don't think you need them. A liquid fertilizer really does probably a better job because in this case, it's one of the few times where you really want to make the plant produce leaves, stem, and root. You're not interested in fruit, so you really want to make sure they have a good, steady supply of fertilizer on a regular basis. Um, the professionals, they do this by computer, and, and, and they'll be fertilizing every half hour, and they'll adjust the rates. Um, and just like your plant in the garden, you want to maintain the proper nitrogen, phosphor, phosphorus, and potassium ratio, anywhere from a 1 1 1 to a 1 2 1 ratio. So, like a 6 6 6 or a 6 12 6. Um, I fertilize weekly. Um, some people fertilize daily. You want to fertilize um, with a weaker concentration. Um, I find fertilizing weekly and following the dilution directions 
on, on the liquid fertilizers um, is the safest way to go. There are many, many alternatives to what you buy in the stores, seaweed, um, all kinds of seaweed extracts, compost tea. Um, you really need to make sure you're getting a high amount of basic nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and micronutrients, iron, boron. You really want the, the, the seedlings to get their nutrition. It's more than just getting organic matter into them. You need to get fertilizer into them, into the root systems. I personally um, super fertilize. Um, I actually use a 15-30-15 house plant fertilizer with good micronutrients and it promotes an even more rapid growth. Um, I haven't had any problems with this. Um, I, I don't know that I would recommend experimenting with it the first time, um, but, but you can go as high as those concentrations. Um, the downside of going that high, at least on the nitrogen I found, is you can get chlorosis, which is a, a, a yellowing a leaf that's different than nitrogen deficiency because the veins of the leaves are green and the rest of the leaf is yellow. And I actually have some liquid nitrogen. You can buy that too. It's a, it's a drench. And what I'll do is I'll alternate. So one week, um, again, I'll mix it up and dilute it. And I'll alternate between the high strength um, nitrogen fertilizer and then just the iron. Okay. Most important, um, and now we're going to get into the, the temperature. I know a lot, of have, a lot of you have questions. You need to maintain constant moisture and soil, soil temperature. And constant means just that. No ups and downs, especially with the soil temperature, which is why indoors is such a, a good place to do that. The soil surface, you want to keep that surface damp, not wet. You want, you want, want that surface to be smooth. Um, and very level before you uh, seed. Um, and you're going to start sowing the seeds on the surface um, whether you cover them or not. I found that to be the, really the, the best way to get the proper depth. Depth is very important. Just about all seedlings, except the ones that stay on the surface, only want to be covered with about a sixteenth to an eighth of an inch of soil mix and you want that to be damp. And when you get off the call, take a look at a ruler. It's 16th of an inch is very, very small. So I found the best way to sow the seeds is just plop them on the surface where you want them. If they're big enough, you're gonna get the right separation, a little or no thinning. Um, and before you put them on the surface, um, your soil mix is gonna be very dry and you don't even wanna put your nose over it because the peat moss, will, the dust will come up and get into your nose. I put the mix in a five gallon plastic bucket like you might use to mop the floor. Um, and I'll, you can name a watering can or hose. Um, you, you just, and the, and the fork comes in handy. Start to wet it, mix it, wet it until it's almost like, a, you know you've got it right if you take a handful in your hand and you compress it and almost like a like a, a dirt a soil snowball it holds its shape then it's the right and then it's just damp you don't want it wet you just want it damp once you've got that that's what you spread on the surface and smoothed you put the seeds down um you sprinkle if you're starting anything that need light you'll sprinkle them on there the ones that don't need, not need light, you mix a little more up in, in your five gallon pail, get it to the same dampness and just kind of take a little handful and between your hands, just shake it over the surface and smooth it out to about a 16th of an inch or an eighth of an inch, like for the cucumbers I started, a uh, bigger seed, typically two to three times the seed diameter is what they recommend. You want to cover it with a clear plastic cover that's raised a few inches. You don't want it an inch above the seedlings because they'll germinate and push into it and get distorted. Um, you apply bottom heat if you need it to adjust the soil temperature. Um, you use the, the glass thermometer in the mix. I'll show you that. 
You can use a heat mat that you can buy or just that old shop light. Anything with low wattage, it can be night lights. Um, when you're germinating indoors, using fluorescent lights and bottom heat. Um, anywhere from 65 to 85 degrees, depending on um, what seed you're starting. Once they germinate, 12 to 14 hours of light. Um, and then at some point, you're going to transplant them into larger and deeper trays once you get um, two or three true leaves. Quick example, shop light on the left is a heat source. Seat mat, seedling mat on the right um, is what, if you want to purchase one that you can use. Okay, soil temperature. Uh, you really want to pay attention to this. Um, this is where I really learned how to do this. Um, in addition to seed depth. Um, tomatoes, for example, they just won't germinate below 50 degrees. Celery won't germinate above 80 degrees. Um, if you can't adjust the temperature or you just don't want to get into adjusting the temperature, 70 works for most plants. Not ideal, but they'll germinate. Um, and I'll show you a detailed chart on the next page. Every plant has an optimum soil temperature um, where the germination time is the smallest and the germination percentage, which you're also interested in, especially if you're starting a specialty seed and you only got 10 or 15 seeds in the package and it costs you four or five dollars. So the red bars, and this is a generic graph, it, it shows you how long it takes for the seed to germinate. And here, this would be um, if I was in New York and I went out in December and put a tomato seed in the ground, it probably wouldn't germinate till April, if it germinated at all. Of course, you can see the germination percentage, which are the green dots, is pretty much down to zero. At some point, you start to get into some decent range where you've got, you know, the days are down to reasonable, and 15 to 20 is not reasonable. You want to do much better than that. Um, uh, and you see in the middle here was optimal, and the two examples I showed you, the cucumbers and the lettuce both germinated in less than three days because I hit the temperature and the germination was basically close to 100%. Okay, this chart is about 70 years old. Um, I first got it from my local extension in 1970 when I was in New York. I wasn't able to germinate peppers and eggplants very well. And once I looked at this chart, um, just a quick look, you can follow my cursor. At 68 degrees, it takes 21, takes 13 days for an eggplant to germinate with only 21% germination. And you don't hit the peak until 86 degrees. So once I got this chart, that was my aha moment. So I highlight three plants here, they're vegetables. Um, they never published one for, um, for um, flowers, and I actually developed my own, which unfortunately I didn't get to include in, in the presentation. But if we go across with lettuce, and what I have in red is um, optimum, at 77 degrees, um, lettuce is 99% germination and two days. 68 degrees, 99% germination, three days. So you can see where you want to sit lettuce, and of course you don't want to ever germinate lettuce in the summer in Florida. Um, if we look at okra, um, a very, very hot germination. You don't get into reasonable um, germination times until you get to about 86 degrees. And then it's seven days. And if you go even, even hotter, you get up to 95 degrees. In six days, okra is a summer crop in Florida. Um, and then if we go down to everybody's favorite, tomatoes, um, 77 degrees, anything between 70 and 80 is going to work for a tomato. Um, about six days, 97% um, at 77 degrees. Okay, so let me stop here, Mindy, because um, we'll see if um, this chart answered um, most people's questions about, about temperature. Thank you. So, um, so to recap the last two charts, um, is basically that the better the temperature for that, what that kind of crop wants, 
the the better the germination, but also the the time it takes for it to germinate is less. So right. we're looking for that sweet spot. And the other thing to remember, the longer the seeds, the, the seed stays under the ground, the more it's expending the stored energy it has in it. So you're going to end up with a weaker seedling. And that may even translate into a weaker plant for its life. You really want to get that plant germinated as quickly as possible, out of the, you know, out of the soil, up in the air, opening up its seed leaves and producing its first true leaves so it can start photosynthesis. So it's, it's not just, you know, inconvenient waiting a little longer. It's best for the seed seedling to get out of that ground as quick as possible. Okay, so a, a couple questions. I think you answered um, some of them. And yes, we can include, uh, oh, someone was asking if you can include your chart that you created for flowers in our follow-up. Are you willing to share, Arnie? Absolutely. Okay. Um, and so, uh, so somebody was asking if they could, <laughs> they're in Canada and it's like negative 12 in their uh, garage. My assumption would be they can't override that temperature with the lights and the heat heating mat. Is that fair? I mean, they might have to burn a lot of electricity to, to make a go of it. Are they much better just doing that somewhere inside? Absolutely correct. I, I have the I would have the same problem in New York. Um, if was, if I was in New York right now, my garage would be about forty degrees. So it's way too cold. It's way too hard to heat. Um, this is why, especially for Canada, um, and, and anywhere in the northern United States, um, indoors is the way you want to go. Okay. Even if it's in a closet, I, it doesn't it doesn't have to be a good. But garage in, in northern climates is just, just not warm enough. It takes too hard to heat and maintain the heat. Thank you. Um, and then uh, someone asked, what is the downside of using, like germinating and starting their transplants in something that's bigger than like a four inch pot? Is that a drainage issue? Uh, for starting the transplants? You can really start them. There's no problem starting them in a bigger pot. Um, it's, it, it's kind of a waste of space. But so in other words, if they were using a bigger pot, they should be doing more in it. And then as they grow, separating them out. Okay, when you mean four inch pot, you're talking just about four inch deep or just a four inch um, round or, or square pot? literally just says what happens if you use over four inch pots uh there's no problem the seed the seed seed doesn't care um if you don't want to transplant you could actually you could put you know one seed in a pot that's what the, what the growers do um and leave it there for in, in your know, entire um till you're ready to put it in the ground from from seed to transplant it can stay in the same pot. The pot just has to be big enough. Um, it's just going to take more space when you start it. The problem is starting it. All right. If you put them in a big pot, you need more. You know, you need more light. You need more uh, surface area to light. You need, you know, an under the counter light is not going to work for very very many plants if you're in if each 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 seed is in a four inch pot. They're good for starting five or ten plants if that's what the person wants to do that's absolutely fine so really the 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 trend the starting trays are really designed um so that you can get away with starting a, a, the largest number of seedlings with the smallest amount of light source so this is this is a light source because if the person wants that it's fine they just have to make sure that the light is there before they go outside Thank you. And someone asked, um, so once these are, once your seeds are germinated, um, what's the rule of thumb of how long should they be under the lights every day? Or how well, long should the light be on? 12 to 14 hours. One, and so they really don't need light, except for the seeds that actually need light to germinate. Um, most seeds don't need light to germinate. 
I, I just, it's easier to leave the lights on because if you're not there when the seed is popping up and you miss a day, that seed's gonna get very spindly very quickly. So I just, I just leave the lights on as soon as I start them. And it's 12 to 14 hours. I put them on a cheap, you can buy a cheap timer in the hardware store so I don't forget. Thank you. Yeah, that would be me. <laughs> so, um, and then two questions about germination that came in. Um, and I will look back through for other questions as we move forward in some of the slides. Um, but one was, somebody noticed that if they pre-soak their seeds overnight, they seem to get better germination. Um, What's your thoughts on pre-soaking? And then uh, someone else asked, um, do they need to worry about scarification of seeds? Um, and so either of those. Okay, first for seed soaking, the, the answer is yes, it will help. But basically what I do, I soak the seeds after I plant them because I keep the, keep the soil moist. So, so you can soak them. Um, and they're a little harder to handle though, because once you soak them, they kind of get a little mushy. Mm. But yeah, you can you can certainly soak them. I don't think you have to, because you're basically, as part of the germination, they're being soaked. The minute you put that seed in there, the minute you cover with the moist soil, and I'll I'll lightly water that a little bit, not a lot. Even after it's all ready, I'll give it a very light watering so on that surface is good and damp. And then I put the plastic cover over it. So you're basically starting the soaking process with the seed in place. So I think it's, I think it, 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 the answer is yes, but I think it actually may be a little harder to get the seed in there and buried properly when it's already been soaked. But yes, you can. Scarification. Yeah, I don't know of any vegetables that need it. I know there are, there are certainly some um, trees and shrubs where you need to do that. Um, again, it, it really is, it's really a, a different variation of the same question. You're basically cracking the seed coat, making it easier for the seed to come out of the seed coat, which is pretty hard. Do the, do the seed packets usually say if and some seed is some seed, some soaked? Sorry. It, would, it would say, it would, it would, if, you, if you're buying the seed, if someone didn't give you the seed, if you're purchasing the seed, then it should certainly say on the package or in a catalog or wherever you got it from, whether you need to do that. I don't know of any vegetables, annuals, vegetables or flowers that need scarification. Okay. Thanks, Arnie. And I'll let you move forward on your slides. And, and yes, some of these charts will, will follow up uh, in an email with some of them. Okay, so now transplanting. Um, and and this, this really can be very quickly. I, I will usually transplant within two or three weeks of the seed start. They germinate fast if you get the temperature right, and they grow very fast in the mix under the lights. So whether you transplant it to individual pots, larger, deeper trays, basically after you have two or three pairs of true leaves um, on the plant, uh, it's time to transplant it. And then you want to move them outside as soon as possible. Depending on where, you're, where you are physically, um, that may not be possible two or three days after transplanting. And you may, to, may need to leave them under the lights longer. But now you're, you have a situation where you have to adjust your starting times now. You, this is a, a decision that is really going to be based on the planting zone you're in and when you start the seeds. But generally, if you've adjusted your starting times to where you would normally put a transplant in the ground, you should be able to move them outside two to three days after transplant. You're just given the most few days, if there's any kind of transplant shock, um, to allow them to start to, you know, taking in nutrients and water again. Uh, and of course, weather permitting. And we'll talk about protection in, in a chart or two. You want to keep the seedlings away from any diseased areas. So if you have a place, if, you're, if you have a, a, a plot, a vegetable plot at home, and you've got certain diseases in there, that's not a good place to put the transplants. Um, and we call the move outside hardening off. 
really what you're basically doing, you're exposing the plants gradually to full sun um, and some wind. You don't want too much. Um, and exposure to the sun, you do this by increasing a few hours each day. Um, sometimes I do this by, um, you know, mornings outside, indoors under the lights for a while. Um, you want to protect from strong winds. If your forecast is for a 20 to 30 mile an hour wind, your transplant's not going to do well in that wind or for a heavy rain. So you want to use some kind of frame. It's got a clear plastic cover on the top. Um, you want to have the lower end of that cover pointing toward the south. So you're getting the, the, the most sun. And again, at least six hours of sun. You still want to keep the soil moist. You don't want to let it completely dry out. Uh, and you really want to avoid allowing the roots to become pot bound. Uh, multiple transplantings will always give you a sturdier plant with a stronger root system. And again, um, the knife and fork is a good way um, if you have a common tray um, to, to cut them cleanly and do the least amount of damage with the roots. The ideal transplant size for plants that have stems that grow up one, two, three feet or more would be eight to 12 inches. If you're growing something with a crown, um, like a lettuce plant or cauliflower plant, um, the ideal size there is probably a five or six inch diameter on the crown. Uh, flowers, it depends on what the flower is. Some are very compact. Um, so it, the size would vary. Okay, cold frames and shade cloths. If you're in Canada, you don't have to worry about shade cloths. If you're in Florida, you do, at least in the summer. You really want to protect the transplants from wind. You don't want to make them immune from the wind. You really want to, um, to have the normal, uh, you know, if it's a five or 10 or even a 15 mile an hour wind, that's probably okay. Um, if it's a gentle rain, that might be okay. Um, so you really want some kind of frame. Um, angled clear plastic cover in the fall, winter, and spring, and that's in Florida. Um, cover should face down to the south, no matter where you are. You want to provide ventilation because if you don't provide ventilation, you can really get, you know, 20 or 30 degrees heating on a hot day inside that, inside that enclosure. Um, and if you really need to provide heat in a northern climate, for example, a frame with plywood sides um, with a little ventilation and a clear plastic cover on the top, you can raise the temperature by about 10 degrees. That allows you to keep the plants out there um, when the ambient temperature is a little too cold. Um, if you're in a hot climate and you're, you're, you're doing this um, in June and July, or if even if you're starting transplants for the fall and you're starting them in the summer here in um, central and southern Florida, um, you need to lower the temperature and a shade cloth can do that. Um, and the recommendation is a 40 to 50% light reduction because the sun is way too strong for, for transplants in the summer. Um, and you can lower the temperature also by up to 10 degrees. Um, a lot of options. Um, in the morning, it's very pleasant here in central Florida. Um, so if you're in that kind of climate, a clear plastic cover in the morning, shade cloth in the afternoon. Um, be aware though that shade cloth doesn't prevent rain from, from penetrating. So here's some examples. Um, the one over the traditional cold frame. Um, this one has clear plastic sides. Um, you can see the cover on the top. Um, there's actually a, 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 a mechanism, a bar that you can raise and lower the thing to, for ventilation. This is what I use um, when I have a temperate climate. I just have two covers. Actually, these covers did come off a cold frame I have. So I'm really barring the top of the cold frame. You can see a tray under there, a wooden tray. And then that's really all you need. Um, it protects against the rain. Um, it filters the wind. Okay, there's an example of a shade cloth on the left. You can buy these, they're not that expensive. Um, this is a picture I found. Actually, someone is actually using this for a permanent. This is, this is, these are not transplants. Someone is actually growing um, some flowers and 
Not sure what what else is in there. Maybe some vegetables. Um, probably in the in the summer. And you can see the shade cloth has been stapled to the frame, but you can take this, cut it in half, because it's actually six feet by three feet, um, and, and, and just use it as an alternate cover in a conventional cold frame. Okay, this is a picture of, only picture I have because it's about almost 25 years old, of the problems that I faced in New York. I was starting a couple of thousand plants, um, this picture was actually taken in the uh, first week in May, and this is actually in my vegetable garden. You can't see it, but all the cool weather plants have already been planted. They're in front here in the foreground, out of the picture in the left. On the right are about a thousand flowers, annual flowers. On the left, in the background, those are tomatoes sitting there in a much higher cold frame. Some stuff I have outside the cold frame. So you can see it, expansion is something you have to factor in. And for me, the only good place I had um, for putting a thousand transplants or more was actually in my, in my vegetable garden in areas where I hadn't planted the warm weather crops yet. So as you do your planning, you really want to plan for where you're going to put the transplants. And really, they can go anywhere. Um, if you have um, a foundation plant and you have some room somewhere and there's just some mulch, you know, you could, you could sit them out there as long as they get the right sun and you figure out how to protect them a little bit. So really, it's just finding a place where the plants can get full sun or at least six hours of sun. Um, and it can be anywhere, anywhere around your house. Okay, so let's and I'll try to do this a little quick because I know we're, we're well over time. Um, I'm going to take you through, and again, some of this is going to look a little familiar, but this is my, my New York setup. Put them in the car driving to Florida. So that thing I showed you, um, that seed starting fixture that was sitting outside my little storage shed, shed is now right inside the door. Um, and this picture was, was taken on 815. Um, the stuff was started on 86. On the left are eggplants and peppers. They've already germinated. Um, in the middle here is my celery. You can see it's a fine mix. It's lower than the other two. Um, I'm starting seven or eight different varieties in one box. Um, it turned out I bought a bunch of plant labels. I didn't use them as plant labels, but they make excellent dividers for what I'm growing. So there's two different varieties of eggplants, two different varieties of peppers, a variety of one variety of celery, four different varieties of tomatoes that haven't come up yet. Off on the right, which isn't in the picture, is some lettuce and some broccoli. So this is a multiple start staged, okay, on a platform. The shop light goes underneath for heating, all right, and, and the tomatoes I haven't planted yet, so they'll shop light will go under there if I need it. It turns out we're, this is in August in New York. It's nice and warm inside that shed. In fact, I keep the door open. It gets a little too warm. So I don't, other than the peppers and the eggplants, that's the only thing I really needed the light for. Okay, so the, the, this picture was on 8.15. This is, I believe, 9-7. Okay, now um, everything's out of the, the starting box, all right? And this is my transport box, because this actually is going to go into the car, all right? And you can see the tomatoes in the back. They haven't even germinated. So in three weeks, you can see the growth. The eggplants and the peppers, the tomatoes have actually passed them and the peppers and eggplants were started earlier. There's the cucumbers, they were started um, almost a month later. So again, when you, you adjust your starting schedules to how much time you need to go from seed to transplant. There's the lettuce and there's the broccoli. Okay, when is it time to transplant? So that picture was on 9-7. 
okay? And this was taken on 9-11. These are in a three inch pot. And the easiest way to tell is look at the bottom of the pot, if it's in a pot or even a, a tray, look at the, you have holes. If you see roots, it's time to transplant. And you can see here, um, this is only about three weeks after the seed was put in the ground. These roots are starting to become pot bound. You can see um, they're circulating around the side. All right, you can't see the bottom, but they're, they're also coming out the bottom. Um, so this was, and again, here for me, I have a limitation of how big a pot I can put it in there because it won't fit in the car. But at any rate, it would be time to put it in a bigger pot, which I did. I put this in a four inch pot. And for a tomato, it's a unique plant. You actually bury some of the stem. And here they are, um, you, know, you know, four days later in the bigger pots. Um, and as far as labels go, um, what I found was, uh, and someone told me this works, you can buy um, mailing labels, all right? And these are four inch by one inch mailing labels, like two or three dollars for a nice package. And they do stick on plastic pots. So for my tomatoes especially, you can't tell one from the other just by looking at the leaf. They're all labeled. So they're in four inch pots. Um, and in this case, I buried as much stem as I could. Okay, finally got there. There are some references. I think Mindy will, Mindy will send this out to you. Um, what I found from looking at these references as I was researching it, very, very consistent um, from all the universe, the extensions and the universities behind them throughout our country and how to do this. So I, I think if you do start to look at some of these references, you'll see this pretty fair agreement among um, you know the the agents and the real um, professors on on, the, on the, the best way to do this. Questions? All right, Arnie. So if you have a question and you know we didn't answer it or um, or you have still have a you know specific question that you want to ask, please feel free to type it again in the chat. Um, I am going to work through some that have been asked. Um, I thought this was interesting. One of the questions was, um, what steps does a person need to take to prevent moisture dripping into the shop light if the light's under the, the seedling tray shelf? You know how you mentioned how you had it for, for warmth? I know sometimes your seed trays don't have drainage because you, you water delicately, but for some of the rest of us, um, if our seed trays have drainage, do we just put it, set it in a tray or what yes. do you think we can do? Set it in a tray would be the answer. And that would be the first answer. And the second answer, answer would be reduce your watering because you shouldn't have water coming out the bottom. I'm, I'm serious. I, like I said, there's, there's a lot of technique in this. Watering is, for, for starting seeds, it's not like watering a plant that you've already planted. Okay. Where you turn the hose on it. You really have to <laughs> learn how to water just the right amount. And the nice thing about about starting seeds, you can practice without the seeds. You can get this all set up. Don't put the seeds in, put the seed mix in, damp it, make believe the seeds are there, water, check it, you know, take the fork, dig it up, see if water comes out. To, get yourself, you know, do the learning before you, before you put the seeds in, especially if they're expensive seeds. So that would be the advice. For, for some of the folks, if they're in our area um, and they are going to be going to, or looking around and getting their supply ready to start seeds really, really soon, um, what should they be looking to start inside now that they could put out in the number of weeks in our area? Okay, um, so this is, this is for Florida now. Yeah. Uh, vegetables it's probably too late to start any of the conventional vegetables. So if you want to, I mean, it, now is a good time to plant any warm weather crop, but unfortunately you're going to have to buy the transplant, whether it's a tomato, a pepper, or an eggplant, um, other than something like okra. 
which means you're getting into summer growing. There's, I mean, there are eggplants. Eggplants will grow throughout the summer. That's a plant that you can start indoors now, plant it in, you know, end of March, early April, and it will actually produce throughout the summer. So you first have to write, and there are tomatoes, actually. There's a, certainly there's a, a Florida native called an Everglades tomato. I've never grown it. I will try it. Um, even though it, it's really a, a, mostly a summer tomato, it grows all year round. It's supposed to grow like a wheat. It's a very small tomato, very small, about it's, a half an inch. So it's, if you're a tomato lover, it's not going to satisfy your need <laughs> for a tomato. But it's a plant that you can grow. It will produce lots of tomatoes. You can start it now. So if you're growing vegetables, there are a set of vegetables that you can start now, but you're really starting vegetables that will grow well in a Florida, at least in Central Florida, in a Central Florida summer. Flower, so, you, um, eggplants, flower. okra, some of the super current or cherry type of tomatoes, and then if they're starting, um, and uh, you grow watermelon. annuals. Watermelon, even, watermelon. even if you want to get a, uh, a head start on watermelon, because again, watermelon falls into the category um, of okra and cucumbers, um, they all need very warm germination temperatures and they don't like cold. Um, watermelon will grow and produce watermelons throughout the summer. Um, I think cucumbers will too. Um, you'll have to be wearful of any disease problems you have with some of these plants wherever you put them. So there's, there are lots of vegetables that you can grow that you would start now. But the most of the traditional ones, no. But in peppers, there are hot peppers that will produce in the summer. But then again, it's a taste thing. You have to like hot peppers. And, and hopefully put the little plants away from young hands and pet hands. Okay. Flowers, flowers, you have much more selection. There's a lot of flowers that do well in the summer here. So now would be an excellent time to start um, annual flowers. That's a really good idea if folks are getting their feet wet. Sorry, uh, go ahead and say that again, Arnie. Pentas, Galadalias, um, there's a whole bunch of others that really will do fine here during the summer. All of them can be started now, should be started now. Okay, wonderful. Um, and then so we're getting specific questions of certain varieties we can start now, but I do want to go back in that someone asked, um, it, does it matter if they're growing inside or outside the, the tray or container they're growing in? Does it need to be opaque? Can it be clear? Um, you know, because sometimes there's like, sometimes, sometimes you read things that you can start things in a milk jug. Um, does it matter? No, you can start them in an empty egg carton. Of course, they'll outgrow that real fast. That's you, you always see that in, in examples of people growing things in egg cartons. Um, no, it doesn't, the color doesn't matter whether it's opaque or not. The seed doesn't care. Um, the roots, in fact, the roots don't want light and they are not going to get it because they're in the soil, but absolutely not anything as long as it holds the soil. If it's, if it's clear and it's outside, are they going to get algae or fungus or anything like that? Uh, not if they're watering properly. Okay. <laughs> if you're so folks like me might have a problem, but folks like you have a have a more uh, versatility of container. Um, okay, and then some of the questions are, any thoughts on winter sowing in New York? Excuse me, could you repeat the question? Any thoughts on winter sowing in New York? My daughter tried that and she had a, um, it wasn't really a greenhouse, but it was, um, it was a completely plastic enclosed and she thought she could put it out on the driveway in the winter and she had some cucumbers and it was a dismal failure. It's just too cold, um, but you can, and I'll put a caveat in, you can grow, there are vegetables, if you're willing to provide enough light you can you can do complete indoor growing of lettuce, for example, and, and it's being done commercially. 
a lot of the growers are finding that, and especially in the big cities, like New York City, I've seen pictures and need the right lights. Now, now you're talking about spectrum colors um, to grow a plant to maturity. But, and you certainly wouldn't grow a vine crazy plant like a tomato um, that way. But there's the plants that you can grow throughout the winter. You need the room. You need the space, you need the light, but the answer is yes, but I would I would work my way up to that. I wouldn't start with that. But yes, you can definitely, you can definitely, if I was still in New York, I'd be doing it. Let me put it to you like that. I had the equipment to do it. I, I had a furnace room with uh, 12, 12 shop lights um, occupying half the room. I absolutely could have done it. I would have had to buy bulbs, but it wouldn't have been a problem. So you have to make the, it's a big investment. So, so I would work my way up to that. Yeah, I, I agree. I wouldn't spend a lot of funds until I figure out how much I enjoy it and if I have the time for it. That makes sense. Would it's you, um, and then someone asked, how do you sterilize your seed trays and your pots and things like that so you can reuse them? Do you okay. have yeah, I, not only that, but I, I do that for everything. I do that for my tools, um, everything that ever touches a, a soil or anything. And the traditional way is you're going to use chlorine. So you buy some Clorox, you dilute it to 50%. Um, depending on how much you're doing, you could put it in a spray bottle. Um, I use a pump sprayer because I got a lot of stuff. I got tomato cages, I got seed starting stuff. I have a whole bunch of stuff. So I, I take it all out there, put it on a driveway, and I just spray everything um, with the 50% um, chlorine solution. Both sides, all sides, you really wanna get, can be fungal spores. Um, it will kill most spores. Um, it has a very short acting, only, you only have a few hours to do this. You could spray it twice and rinse it off well um, and then store it. Thank you. Um, so a few questions came in. Um, so I do have to watch the video back to make sure we have good audio and everything like that before we can post it. And it is a longer video, so it might be a couple weeks before it appears in YouTube. Um, but we, I do send a resource link email with um, some of the charts and other links that Arnie's mentioned throughout his talk. Uh, so if you registered through Eventbrite, you'll get that in an email with hopefully within a few days. Um, and then we did have some other questions that were coming in basically. Um, and some I answered for you. I hope you don't mind and I hope I did it well. Um, someone was asking when you start your plants, you mentioned you actually do them in the, the room that you are. And then they asked, you know, where you're growing them. And I said, then they go out to the community garden plot. Um, correct. Do you have any that you grow in your condo the whole time or, or they mostly all go outside? Uh, or go outside. I'm in a um, I'm I'm in a really gated HOA. You can't do anything community. I'm on a postage stamp lot, so I don't I don't. The only place that I have to grow vegetables is on my lanai, and I do do I do grow them on my lanai, but I use grow boxes. You grow beautiful vegetables in your grow boxes. Right. So if you have a lanai, um, and actually I'll cover some of this in the, in the tomato course. Um, you can really get very close to producing what some of the commercial growers do using a grow box. And I've even got a new one. I may get it in there of, of a technique um, that a grower uses where you're using a grow box in an unconventional way. So you can, if you have the room on your lanai, um, you can grow any vegetable you want on your lanai. So that class is called Totally Tomatoes. That comes up later this month. You can register through Eventbrite. A couple more questions. And so um, I'm going to kind of call it quits within the next five minutes just to um, be respectful of Arnie's time. And I have a meeting coming up. But um, somebody mentioned that their front porch is fully shaded. What's the best plant or flowers to put there? Uh, impatience would be my number one. In my, in my home in New York, I was very heavily shaded. 
Even in my vegetable garden, at best, I got six hours of sun. And that's where I put the tomatoes. Um, I had big oak and maple trees and I had flowers under everything. And patience and begonias will grow in full, they love full shade. They'll produce beautiful flowers. They prefer much more than, um, in fact, they won't really grow well in full sun. They want filtered sun, but they grow great in full shade. So th those would be the two off the top of my head. There are probably more. Yeah, and if you're gonna go perennial, you can do azaleas if you don't mind keeping your soil acidic. Um, that'll, it'll bloom in less light. Um, the, nice, the nice thing about impatience, they're very popular everywhere. They're expensive to buy. Um, they are, I won't say hard to grow, but like the celery, very small seed, you know, need light. So you sprinkle the whole the whole sprinkle thing goes with them goes from patience. So and then thank you and then milkweed for butterflies. Um, do you are you familiar with milkweed and when we plant them? Uh, yeah, um, you would milkweed should survive a summer, but now is probably not the best time to plant it unless it get, you want to establish it before the summer. Um, so I would, I would, I would wait at least here in Florida. Um, I, I would wait, I would wait until the summer is over. It depends if if you're taking care of it, if it's at your home, you know, and you know, it, it, once it's established, it'll be okay. Um, but if if you've planted it too late and it really hasn't established a good root system yet, it might struggle during the summer. Okay. Um, can you start kale and sun gold tomatoes now? Uh, you can start them, but it really depends on where, not here in Southwest Florida. Kale is a cool weather crop. Um, um, it, it would be very, if you started it now, you really wouldn't get anything worth eating. Um, and sun gold, actually, cherry tomatoes will, will survive the summer. They will grow during the summer. You'll probably get some cherry tomatoes, but not like what you're used to. I would, if I had to pick a number, I'd say the fruit production is going to be down by 50 to 75 percent for a cherry tomato. Okay. Um, and also, there was a question of: Do these techniques carry over well to rooting cuttings? <clears throat> well, probably not in a great way, um, because you, if you're going to root a cutting, um, you generally you're going to put some kind of, you know, you're going to coat it with some material. You know, they sell um, paste and liquids that encourage the the cutting to form the root. You can root in water, but this usually you'll root in something like vermiculite or perlite. So you're not starting to see, there's nothing there. That cutting really has nothing to grow, right? What you want, what you're doing with the encouraging, I'm sorry, with the cutting is you're encouraging it to make roots. So they have, again, you put materials on the ends, you dip them in it, and it, it, it encourages the stem to send out a root. And you're gonna put that in a root, you know, root growing medium, which you could actually use a seed starting mix but you really don't need that. At that point, it doesn't, it doesn't need, I mean, you got the leaf there, you got the stem there. You're really just growing the roots. You wanna just get root growth. You're not looking for stem growth, um, leaf growth, much photosynthesis. You really just want the root to start to grow. And you may want a little less direct light, depending on what it is compared to- well, you, wouldn't be, you wouldn't be putting it in direct sunlight. You would probably keep it in, in shade you know, without a root system, this whole thing is going to just wilt. So I think we got most of them. If um, I'm going to put my email address in the chat box. So if for some reason we missed you and you want to send me an email, um, I can get with Arnie and get you a good response. So it is in the chat box. And um, I want to say thank you. Uh, we still have more than half that are still with us. Um, and we had, I think, 
about 70 folks tune in today. And so uh, it was really enjoyable hearing about seed starting and growing transplants um, and really wonderful information, Arnie. And I will um, work to share out some of the resources and the cool charts and information that you gave us today. And I wanna, I wanna thank everybody because um, I love to talk about this stuff. So I wanna thank the audience for, especially the people that hung in this long uh, and I hope everyone walked away with something they can use from this. So oh. it's, it's been my pleasure. Thank you, Arnie. And one last question. Sorry, sure. they yeah. asked and I forgot to get it in there. Do you do a paper that you put behind the grow light? Somebody asked about tin foil or white paper for reflection. Yes, anything white, all surfaces. Um, I don't need much on the top because I've, I've taken care of that in this structure I built, but definitely on the sides, yes, on the back. In fact, one of the pictures uh, that I showed, you saw some white behind, um, inside the little shed. Anything that will reflect more light onto the plant and, and white is a surface you want to use. Silver is, would be okay, but paper is cheap. Tape it onto the top of the light fixture, tape it onto the wall a piece of scotch tape, anything that works. Thank you. Thanks again. Bye, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Bye, everybody.